following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Ecce homo, the symbiosis of the Bodhisattva. In essence, the symbiosis of the Bodhisattva is the psychological relationship of the Bodhicitta and the Bodhisattva through Buddhi, which means wisdom related with the Sephira Gebura by means of nemesis, <coughs> karma. Within the initiate of the straight path, Sophia, Wisdom is a concrete outcome of a symbiosis, that is, the psychological initiatic relationship between the Bodhisattva and the Bodhicitta, a mixture of the light of Chokhmah, Christ, with the darkness or sapience of sin. This symbiosis is shown in Exeomo, the Bodhisattva, the superior manas with objective reasoning, which emerges on the sixth day of Genesis. Exeomo, behold the heavenly man the Bodhisattva working within the terrestrial man, the Bodhicitta, in order for the man of the sixth day to appear. Sophia, which means wisdom, is the outcome of the multiple sonderable divisions of the light. In other words, multiple Enfoldment of the light. Tifereth is the Bodhisattva, the Tosoma Neumaticon, who works through the At in Yesod within the Bodhicitta, the Tosoma Suchikon. In order for us to understand this uh, symbiosis, which is made through karma or nemesis, we have to utilize, again, the tree of life. Remember that we always uh, apply the tree of life when we go into Christianity, because as we always stated, it is rooted in Judaism, and Judaism is Kabbalah, the tree of life. So, 
when you visualize the tree of life, you find there that there are three triangles. You always have to comprehend and understand that each triangle is always related with the three brains. So if you apply the numbers of each triangle, then you find that Keter is the head, Chokmah is the heart, and Bina is sex, in relation with the three brains. Well, as we say, intellectual brain, emotional brain, and sexual, motor, instinctual, sexual brain. That's why Bina is always uh, related with sex. But if you continue applying the triangles to the three brains, and then you start visualizing how the tree is related with the development that uh, uh, of the real man, the true man that we are talking here. We find here, for instance, the second triangle. Hesed, Geburah, Tifereth. You find that Hesed, again, is in relation with the head. Geburah, with the heart. And Tifereth, to the sex. This is how you find the relation of Tiferet, which in the tree of life is precisely in the heart, directly related with the sex. And why the sixth commandment states, you shall not fornicate. Which means, it's a commandment directly related with Tiferet. The number six, that's human soul. But in the triangle, when you take the triangle and you put it in your three brains, it goes, according to the dissension of the ray of creation, into sex. And, continuing with the tree of life, if you take the third triangle, Netzah, Hod, and Yesod, again, Netzah is the head. And that's why you find that Netzah is in relation with the mind. Hod is in relation with the emotional center, the heart. And Yesod... We always state and repeat in many lectures, is always sex. So then you find there, specifically, that Chokmah, Gebura, and Hod are precisely vibrating in the heart. Then you find there all the relation with the tree of life in your three brains, why Hod is the emotional body called astral body. And it's precisely when the light of Chokmah shines. But obviously, beyond Hod, you find the other Sephirah related with the heart, Geburah, which is always in relation with the sun, as we explain always. Geburah, many Kabbalists state that uh, is in relation with Mars, which is true but it's also related with the sun. And that's why when we talk about Geburah, we talk about the sun. And the sun uh, uh, is uh, ruling Geburah and Tiferet at the same time. And beyond Geburah, in the heart, in that area, we find Chokmah, according to the three brains, which is wisdom. So then this is how you find that wisdom, Chokmah, is in relation with Geburah, which in Buddhism is called Buddhi, which means wisdom. And it is because the Divine Mother places all the uh, forces, we will say, related with nemesis, with karma, within Geburah. That's why in Gnosticism we state that Geburah is the interior particular individual kaom. Our own particular police, interior law. So when you talk about the law of karma within you, this is Geburah. And of course, Geburah, as it is stated by 
Madame Blavatsky, taken from uh, ancient books, is Buddhi wisdom, which is the spiritual soul within which the flame of prajna, which means wisdom, is always burning. That prajna paramita, which is the sixth paramita. And if you count from the bottom, from Malkut to Gebura, you find the number six. So you see all the relationship here with this mysterious, really, Gebura, which many Kabbalists uh, have dif difficulties to comprehend. Especially when we go into the Gospels. Because this Gebura is a sephira of willpower, strength. You know, Gebura means uh, severity. Hmm? And in here you find, where we were talking in other lectures, the Valkyrias. The Amazons. And it's feminine. So therefore, you find the relationship because really when we talk about the monad, we find the relationship of the spirit with the consciousness. When we talk about objective reasoning, we always refer to Gebura, to the consciousness. But let me uh, refer something. So from Keter to Gebura, Gebura is the number fifth. <coughs> and fifth, number five, is in relation with karma, with nemesis. In Greek. And from Malkut, to Gebura is the sixth sephira, which is related with the arcanum of indecision, the arcanum of the lovers. And this is precisely where we find always the twin soul. When we as human beings in Tifereth think about our twin soul, we have to understand that that twin soul is within. In the intu to intuitional world. The world of intuition. Within which the objective reasoning of the being is placed. And this is precisely why we have to understand. Because when we talk about the bodhicitta. It's precisely the objective reasoning of the being which expresses itself in the physical body, but that has its foundation or its roots, its gravity in Gebura, the superior consciousness of the being. And it's feminine. So, from the one who takes the straight path, Gebura, Sophia, Wisdom is Helen, according to Greek mythology. Helen means all glorious. And Helen is the daughter of Nemesis. The Divine Mother Justice, the superlative consciousness of the being. Buddhi is like a glass of alabaster, as we said where the perennial flame of the Pragna Paramita is always burning. So when we talk about the goddess of justice, Nemesis, it related with karma, remember that uh, Buddha stated that there are three eternal things in the universe. First, the space. Second, nirvana. And third, nemesis, which in Sanskrit is karma, the law of cause and effect. 
So this nemesis, of course, is uh, that goddess of justice or within which the causes of the universe are hidden. When the universe is disintegrated, destroyed, within the Mahapralaya, great cosmic night, everything is destroyed except the causes or the effects, we will say, of uh, cause and effect. So that remains within the bosom of the Divine Mother. And that's why when we think about uh, uh, Sophia, it is stated that Sophia, wisdom, emerges always. In the beginning, from, from, from the unknowable absolute. But the causes for Sophia to come from the absolute into creation into the universe is because of nemesis. But this Sophia, of course, uh, uh, in different myths, in this case, is called Helen. Because Geburah really received many names in different, in different mythologies. The Valkyries, Helen, uh, Sophia, and of course, Sophia uh, in Gebura is only an unfoldment of another Sophia, which is Gebura, I mean, uh, Chochma, and which is the other Sophia that comes directly from the ends of Or. But Gebura precisely is that uh, Sephira that now we are entering because, if you recall, in the sixth day of Genesis, according to Moses, is when the man is created into the image of God. And we talk many times about that Toma, Tosoma Suchi Kong, the image of God, was created in the sixth day. But that is a mixture of the Toma Suchi Kong and the Tosoma Neumaticon, which is the spiritual man, which is the Bodhisattva. So Helen according to Greek mythology, is the daughter of Nemesis. So here we have to state and to remember that when we reach the fifth initiation of Mayor Mysteries, which is Tifereth, and then we decide to take the spiral path or the straight path. And that is in relation, of course, with Geburah, how we are going to deal our destiny with the goddess of justice, which is Nemesis. Of course, that goddess of justice, Nemesis, is the Divine Mother Kundalini. The Divine Mother, because you know, we stated many times that the Divine Mother has different aspects. As the Divine Mother's space, we will say, is the origin of the universe. So, the causes of the universe are within her womb. And that is called Nemesis. That's why the Greeks name her Nemesis. So, when the initiate decided to take the straight path, then Helen is being born. You see, this is one uh, uh, interpretation, we will say, of the myth. Because every myth has seven interpretations. But here we're talking about a straight path. So the Divine Mother Justice, the superlative consciousness of the being, Buddhi, is like a glass of alabaster. So the Greek goddess of Nemesis, according to the Greeks, helped to avenge those who were wronged originally in a, an abstraction or righteous indignation against evil. So Nemesis is uh, portrayed as the goddess of divine justice and vengeance. Her righteous wrath 
is directed towards human transgressions of the natural right order of things. So, when you write that, that the Divine Mother, or Nemesis in this case, the symbol of the Divine Mother, avenges against the transgressors of, of the rules of the universe, you and then understand, according to Gnosticism, that she indeed does it in different aspects. Because through her is how the justice is applied. Remember that when we meditate and comprehend an ego, when we implore to the Divine Mother, she inside is the origin of that. She knows the karma. And she knows how to apply it and to punish the trans transgressor, in this case the ego. She is unmerciful against the uh, she is unmerciful against the ego. And this is how we have to understand. That's how she helps. She knows that the ego is a cause of the disorder in the universe, a particular universe and other universes. And that's why uh, it is stated that Zeus. Jupiter was pursuing her and she was disguising herself in different ways in order to uh, escape from Zeus. But finally she became and transformed herself into a goose. And then Zeus transformed himself into a swan. To transform Zeus, Jupiter, into a, into a swan that go, uh, is pointing us immediately be nah. So we will find that Zeus Jupiter, of course, is represented by Ketejo Ma Bina, the first triangle. But transforming Zeus into a swan means becoming Bina. Because the swan, the white dove, and all of these birds of whiteness is always the representation of the sexual energy of God in action. And it says there that uh, Zeus uh, impregnates Nemesis, the Divine Mother. And from that, uh, an egg, uh, the Divine Mother puts an egg. And then Leda takes that egg and hatches the egg. And from it comes Helen of Troy, the famous Helen. It was the cause of the war between Greeks and Trojans. Actually, uh, Helen was not a Trojan woman, but a Greek because she was abducted by the Trojans and took them to Troy. That was the origin of the war. Of course, all of that story has a symbolism. In which when you enter, again, you see a war. When you enter into the straight path, there is a war that is going to start. The Mahabharata, the Great War. I'm not saying that these wars that uh, are stated in this book didn't uh, happen. I'm saying that when the writer write or, or assemble that and, and names these symbolic names are pointing always to the psychological work that we have to perform. So here, Helen, of course, is that particular element that is placed by uh, the Holy Spirit, the Swan, Zeus, transformed into the Holy Spirit, the Swan, into Gebura. Of that particular monad that took the straight path. Meaning that within that egg is Chochma, the justice. We talk about the inheritance, the cosmic inheritance that our own particular uh, Christ places in the monad. Well, he's placed in Geburah. In order to develop, because that is Chokma doing the sacrifice in order for work, in order to work into the different sephiroth of that particular man that is taking the straight path. So, this is how you have to comprehend when you see Chokma, Christ. Working through, uh, sorry, 
working through uh, the heart. Because we always state that the atom nous is in the left ventricle of the heart. And that this atom is directly co connected to the monad. If you apply, as I said, the three triangles in the three brains, then you see how Homa is related with the heart, with Gebura, and with, nu and with uh, Hod in the same heart. Huh? That's called the, 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 the brain related with the sun, with love, and with justice. Huh? Because when we talk about justice, about the sun, we're talking about uh, Gebura. And of course, you find in the Bhagavad Gita, which is written by Chokhmah, with the name of Krishna, which is wisdom. I mean, Chokhmah is wisdom. So in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna states, <coughs> The great Prakriti, my womb, which is the Divine Mother, Justice, in that I place the germ, thence, O Bharata, is the birth of all beings. Whatever forms are produced, O Kuntreya, in any womb whatsoever, the Prakriti is their womb, and I am the seed giver father. You see, this is the same meaning as I explaining about Zeus in, the, in Greek mythology. That the Christ is always the give, uh, the, the given, seed given uh, father of any seed. But in this case, of course, in Gebura is how uh, we will say all the conquerings, all the achievements that they initiate develops in any of the sephir of below is absorbed by the consciousness. So this in, in this consciousness is of course the knowledge of uh, good and evil. Remember that uh, We were talking uh, in other lectures about the six degrees of objective reasoning that each one of us has to develop when we enter into the straight path. And uh, it happens that, again, is in relation with the number six, which is Gebura. Is in relation with the sixth day of Genesis when the man is created into the image of God. So this uh, six degrees of objective reasoning are related with, uh, with that Sephira Gebura, which we are entering. The Master Samael on the Or states, in the Pisti Sophia, the following. The descent of the Logos into matter is made dialectically comprehensible by means of the cosmic drama. The, immer the immersion of the spirit into matter is dialectically explainable with the life Passion, death, and resurrection of Christ within us. Sophia is the outcome of the descent of the Logos into the chaos. This is the one that takes the straight path. Sophia enters into the chaos because we, particularly psychologically speaking, we are a chaos. And of course, within it, we find the ego, which Sophia, called, in Pisces Sophia, is called the lion face light power, which is a triple inferior power, mind, desire, and sexual degeneration. Behold here the three brains again. Mind, desire, and sexual degeneration. 
These three aspects have nothing to do with that which is beyond the body, affections, and the mind, that which is the truth. The great emanations of Barbello, the abode of the light, can never be comprehended by the intellectual light. The uncreated light is distinct from the intellect as water is from oil. When the initiate lets himself fall, he then cannot enjoy the emanations of Barbello. There are those who, being jealous of the abode of Barbello, fall into the darkness on purpose, where the cries and snatching of teeth are heard. And then the ego is being born within each one of us. The self-will ego never obeys, and, it always, and it's always emanating from itself that which should never be emanated. And when the initiate falls, of course, immediately the emanations of Sophia are cut. And the initiate just remains with the wisdom of the intellect, the light of the intellect, which many people mistake with Sophia. In this day and age, there are many Gnostics, there are many, uh, we will say, uh, readers that read about Gnosticism. And when they read uh, about Sophia and the objective reason of, of the being, they think that is our own particular intellect, the reasoning that we use. But that type of reasoning is not related with Sophia. A type of chitta that we always talk, which is the body chitta, which is the prajna paramita, is a type of reasoning which you don't find opposites. Related with the senses of the consciousness that we have to awake. And of course, the Gospels were written with that objective reasoning. And that's why people do not understand them. And make different assumptions about uh, uh, the drama, the life, passion, and death and resurrection of uh, Jesus Christ, which is written in the four Gospels. And all other apocrypha that we find in, the, in different books. So, when anybody... Uh, reaches for the first time the union, finally, of the Soma Suchi Kong with Soma Neumati Kong, which is the son of man with the terrestrial man, after the annihilation of all the ego and passing through the nemesis of the karma of that particular sphere and then uh, appears in his head what we call the horns the silver horns of the great hierophants which are represented in the in Nordic mythology those horns of the uh, great uh, uh, gods of the Nordic pantheon are not the horns of demons, because the horns of demons are in front, in the forehead, and that and that's the power of the intellect. You have to understand that. There are two powers here. When you see the power of any intellectual, any person that is very intellectual, in this uh, uh, level of the intellectual animal kingdom, In the astral plane, this person shows big horns, which is the mark of the beast. Because it's just animal intellect. It has nothing to do with the spiritual intellect. So that's why the demons, more dangerous demons that exist in the universe, are intellectual. Very smart from the intellectual animal point of view. In the construct, in the in the opposite, we find the great resurrected master that also have horns, 
like Moses, when coming down from the Sinai, he is showing those horns of light on top of his head. Not in, in his forehead, but on top of the chakras and Hazarara. This is where those horns appear. And in there you find the degree of objective reasoning related with Gebura that they acquire after defeating the ordeals of Lucifer or Shatan, as the Bible says, which always acts according to Gebura. In other words, when you are being tested, tempted by your own particular individual Lucifer in any plane below Gebura is doing it according to your own karma. Because that karma is in relation with that ego that you have within. And he moves everything according to the ego that you have within. According to the karma that also you have. Because you can annihilate the whole ego, but the causes of karma is still there. And the only one that can uh, forgive that karma is the goddess Nemesis. Or her son, which in this case is Christ being born within the Bodhisattva. But for that, the Bodhisattva has to pass all the ordeals that Lucifer has to pass in order to show what is the ego or the different psychological aggregates that we have within. So, after defeating Lucifer, according to the law, because if you read the book of Job, then you find there how Job submitted this, uh, uh, I mean, how Satan of Lucifer submitted Job to different ordeals. And when Job succeeds, triumphs, then the objective reasoning of the being develops in the initiate. And of course, there are uh, different uh, levels of reasoning of the being. Let us read what the Master Samael says about the objective reasoning of the being and the different degrees. He says, Sophia is the objective reasoning of the being, the awakened consciousness, the complete, complete functionalism of Pisces Sophia is within the objective reasoning of the being. The Gnostic Christic esotericism that we are talking here, we always quote six degrees of the consciousness Conscious objective reasoning of the being. The degrees of development of the objective reasoning of the being are known by the number of tridents that are shown on the horns of the individual Lucifer who is within each one of us. Obviously, the individual Lucifer within each one of us is a reflection of Christ within our interior. This is why he is referred as Christus Lucifer. He is the one that comes down and mingles with your ego. And this is the one that knows about you. That's why if you want to see how bad, how evil you are, how many Different do you have, then you can see it through your own Lucifer. But for that you need a lot of courage. Because Lucifer is the one that tempts you, that tests you in order to become perfect. And Lucifer gives us the sexual impulse. Therefore, Lucifer is the stairs to ascend and the stairs to descend. We arise by defeating Lucifer. So when Lucifer is defeated, it integrates with us 
and convert us into archangels. So, when an archangel appears, it's because it has objective reasoning. Any archangel is that. But you have to understand that from this point of view, an archangel is that individual that, that reached resurrection. Because in Nirvana, you find different hierarchies. And also in Christianity, we find uh, that uh, the beings related with the second heaven are called archangels. Conventionally. But really here, we are talking about an archangel, which is really a cosmo creator. A self-realized master, completely. That annihilated ego has no ego within. And therefore, his objective reasoning is there developed. But uh, commonly, the archangels have the degree, the objective reasoning, which is called Degindad. Degindad. Which is where or when the tridents, three tridents, appear in the horns of Lucifer, which is integrated with them. Remember here, I am going to repeat something that is very important, that is coming into my mind. That uh, when Adam and Eve eat or, uh, from the, when they ate from the tree of good and evil, the Elohim is written in the Bible, says, Behold, the man is like one of us, knowing good and evil. It means that any Elohim knows, any cosmo creator knows good and evil. It's like one of us. So that good and evil, of course, is the outcome of Sophia. The mixture of dark and light. Or the sapiens of sin. That's evil. Because when you disintegrate your, their defects, you understand all of the, the relationship of the ego with evil, with devolution, with degeneration. And then you find the opposite, which is the right action, right thought, and right feeling. But that knowledge, that sapiens, remains in you. That's why an archangel is not easily bit, uh, tempted. Because they know good and evil. But in the beginning, as you see, in, uh, for instance, in many books of, uh, of Gnostic books, you find that uh, it is written that, that Adam and Eve fell or went down easily, tempted by Lucifer, because they didn't know good and evil. If they wouldn't know good and evil, they wouldn't eat. Or they wouldn't have eaten that fruit of the tree of knowledge. So here you find precisely that uh, an archangel is somebody that has the knowledge of good and evil within. And that is shown in the horns of Lucifer, who is the one that put that man or that archangel into the surface, into the leveling with he is or she is. That's why in Greek mythology, you find that Prometheus, which is Lucifer there, according to Greek mythology, is the one that steals the fire from the sun and gives to the men. And he creates the men. Because to the ordeals, and the man is succeeding and defeating ordeal, trust plus ordeal, plus ordeal, obviously then the man of the sixth day appears after defeating Lucifer with the objective reasoning. And uh, Degindad is a common degree acquired by any resurrected uh, archangel which has, of course, the sign is three tridents uh, marked in those horns. 
And that's why when you read any uh, book or any wisdom or you hear any uh, knowledge from these uh, resurrected masters, you always find different uh, levels of comprehension, different levels of understanding. Because it's a degree of objective reasoning that that initiative acquired. So when you acquire, for instance, an archangel, let's put an example, an archangel, acquire that Degindad level, which is three tridents. But in the universe, there is the, the fourth tri, uh, trident within the horns of the archangels, so those horns that appear in the resurrected one, which gives another degree of objective reasoning, which is more profound. It, it has more understanding, more comprehension. And that is called the ternunald. Ternunald level of objective reasoning. And above that is what is called Podkulad, which is five tridents. This level of Podkulad, level of objective reasoning of the being, is very rare. It's five tridents. In other words, it means that that initiate have defeated Lucifer very profoundly. He went very down into the abyss and emerged with a lot of light. But about Putkulad is the last degree, which is six tridents. Anklad, which is precisely the complete development of Gebura and all the wisdom of Chokmah within it. Beyond that, is, is, there is no more degrees. Six degree. Anklad. And of course, in the universe, those that take the straight path always want to acquire Anklad. But when you reach resurrection, and God is within you, Lucifer is very clean, has no ego, and everything is within you. You are an archangel. And if you have uh, the Gindad, the, the, the three tridents, if you want to acquire more degree of reasoning, you cannot. You cannot because God is within you. Because it's you, the one that is acquiring it. The Logos, you know, Keterho Mabina is within you. You are the vessel of those trident, but those Ketejo, Ma, and Bina work through you, or the Holy Trinity work through you to the Archangel according, in accordance to the degree of objective reasoning. And this is what gives sapience, omniscience, omnisapience to the Archangel or to the Elohim. So, in order to acquire a higher degree, and then you have to renounce, you have to abandon your level of, or your hierarchy. And you do it through TFRF. How? Well, when you are already resurrected, the tree of good and evil is forbidden for you, which is, means sex, no sexual act. Because as Master Jesus states in the Gospels, the angels in heaven are not having sex at all. They don't get married. But if Tifre decided, says, I want another degree of reasoning, because before entering into the absolute, I want unclad. Well, if he's a male, the sense takes physical body and have sex with a woman. Has to fall in love with a woman. This woman could be an initiate or could be a vestal and have sex. And not to fornicate. Just to start practicing sexual magic without spilling. 
But because it's forbidden for him to do that, immediately his Elohim says, I'm withdrawing from you. You are disobeying me. That's called a dissension or a dissent, in other words. A dissent. There's no fornication there. But sometimes, Tiferet, there into the physical body, decides to take another degree of objective reasoning and commit the mistake of fornicating. And then he falls. And when he falls, the ego is reborn again like the phoenix bird within him or within her. And separate, not only is separated from his Elohim, but has the ego within again. And that's precisely the problem when you go and you are prohibited to perform the sexual act. Two ways. There are many, the master says, many fallen bodhisattvas that decided to acquire all the degree and in the moment of transmutation, they couldn't uh, control Lucifer, the tempter, because Lucifer is the one that gives the sexual impulse. And they fornicate it. They, they lose everything, they have to start again. Of course, they will acquire another degree. But after suffering a lot with the devil inside of them, because the ego is the devil. And of course, in the universe, as we have stated in other lectures, this is only permitted to do it seven times. More than seven times, you can fall into damnation. And that's precisely the big problem in the universe, because initiates wants to acquire more objective reasoning. And this is precisely related with Geburah. Because then, Nemesis is very severe, which is the Divine Mother. Because in the moment when the initial descent is betraying the Divine Mother, is committing adultery, because is refusing the love of the Divine Mother in order to go with another woman down there, or with another man, whatever. And then, of course, the, the law is very severe. When the initial wants to back again, it's not like, I fall today and tomorrow I will transmute and, and go up and have another degree. No. Nemesis enters then and punishes you. Master Samael on the earth stated that the last time that he fell, which was the third time, because he fell three times. And the last time was in the beginning of this root race, in Tibet, when this root race was starting. And he tried to resurrect in Egypt, in China, and trying to do it by his being withdrawn from him and was punishing him. Until now, which is the end of this Kali Yuga, when we are in the end of Aryan race, his inner being took him and says, okay, it's enough punishment for you, but you had to learn. If you do it a fourth time, who knows, maybe a Mahamambantara will lead you. You know what I mean? This is precisely the, the justice. So it's not like, uh, uh, no, it's not a, a eternal. But of, of course, in the universe, time doesn't exist. And this is how punishes, uh, uh, God punishes their children. And this is how you find there, according to Nemesis, how she comes and punishes not only the human soul, but the ego as well. Or better said, right? Not only the ego, but the, the human soul as well. Because the ego deserves to be punished. Something that sh shouldn't be there inside of the Bodhisattva. Or inside the, the initiate. But the soul cannot be destroyed. Because the, the soul is part of the monad. It's eternal. But it can be punished. In order to learn. Because in Tiferet, you find your free will. You decide to follow this, to follow that, and to do whatever you want, because God gives you free will. Right? We're talking about here the, the Bodhisattva. Now, from Malkut to Gebura is the Buddhata. That develops 
within the bodhicitta. It is the truth emerging from the abysses of klipoth. This is how you have to understand. Because in many lectures we always state that the part of Gebura which descends into the abyss with the ego is the Burata. When we never did this work in previous lives or previous ages, that Burata is an embryo of soul. But in a fallen Bodhisattva, the objective reasoning of the being is placed in that that we call the auric embryo. That auric embryo is where you find the mastery, the objective reasoning. Unfortunately, when the Bodhisattva falls, that consciousness, objective reasoning, gets mingled again with evil, with ego, and goes into Malkut, into the abyss. Because from Malkut down is where you find fornication. And that's why you find that a Bodhisattva, a fallen Bodhisattva, has that inside the ability to use once in a while when he can uh, stop uh, uh, thinking like ego and to bring that objective reasoning, that ability of penetrating into the language of God. But while he disintegrates more ego and more ego, that ability of objective reasoning is appearing. And of course, eventually, if he or she achieves resurrection, he will acquire another degree right, of objective uh, reasoning. And of course, that emerges from the abyss. That's why it's written that the Elohim, the gods, knowing good and evil, emerge from the abyss. And they get lost into the absolute. But they go down many times. As repeat, is permitted to a resurrected martyr to do it seven times. So there are many gods, as the Master Samael said, that are jealous of Sophia. Meaning that are jealous that other archangels have more wisdom than them. Sophia is, is shining more s- strong strongly there in, in those and then so I want that objective reasoning well they had to renounce and they descend so of course here we are entering into a mystery that is called Mary Magdalene that purposely the Pharisees and doctors of the law erased from the Gospels, which is the relationship of Tifereth with Gebura, which in this case, in the representation of the drama of Jesus Christ, is Jesus with Mary Magdalene. And here we had to stay and to enter into this mystery because remember that it's stated. That Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. But we have to understand that anyone that is fallen, anyone that is not resurrected, his, her, Budata, or Auric embryo, which still has ego in there, is prostituted. You have to understand that that is the symbol precisely of, of that because. The Burata is part of Neshama. Neshama here, we are talking about the, 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 that spiritual soul, talking in Kabbalah, that there are three souls. Nefesh, Ruach, and Neshama. Here we are talking about Neshama, which is within Gebura. That is the spiritual soul, which is united with God. Part of it, which is the Burata, is which is bottled up. With that burata, is precisely with which we can develop Tifereth, the human soul. Because Tifereth is only an embryo when you are not reaching mastery. But when you reach the fifth initiation, Tifereth is completely developed. This is what you have to understand. 
because we have to go down in order to build soul. Soma Suchi Kong means soul image. So all this work that we do with Buddhism and Christianity or alchemy is precisely the development of that Soma Suchi Kong, which is the Buddha developing through meditation and through alchemy. Knowing good and evil, because it's precisely uh, uh, from where the sapiens of good and evil is coming from. Remember that is the part of us that ate the fruit. So through transmutation, through Lucifer, to the sexual potence, defeating that entity different times, is how that Burata emerges. And when he's reaching Tifereth, and then you have a human being. The Hume, many times we said, is the monad, which is a trio. Unity of spirit, divine soul, and human soul. And the man, the manas, is that chitta that we are talking here, which is of course related with Tifereth, Netzah, Hod, Yesod, and Malkut. That union is what is We're making space here for... That union is what is called the man or the human soul in its totality. So, of course, that human soul in his totality within a fallen bodhisattva is the auric embryo which is being liberated little by little again and recuperating the degree of objective reasoning that he lost or she lost and giving more wisdom with the work that he is doing again through his resurrection. And this is how we have to understand uh, the work. But this, this uh, Buddha, which is bottled up within Malkut, within the ego, and even into Klipoth, is prostituted, obviously. Anyone that is a fornicator, or that fornicated, whether he's fallen or is doing it for the first time, is prostituted. His soul, her soul, is prostituted. And that is precisely the symbol of Mary Magdalene, attributed to that particular part of the initiate that is bottled up there. And of course, that Mary Magdalene, as you know, is a prostitute. And a prostitute is a soul, in this case a woman, that takes many uh, men. Have sex with many men. And this is precisely what happened with the initiative when it's fallen. Has sex, or she has sex with many men, and if it's a man, with many women. Committed adultery. Who is not adulterous? That's precisely Jesus of Nazareth saying when kneeling down and written, uh, writing, I mean, on the ground. And standing and says, he who, he who is without sin, throw the stone against her, against that uh, prostitute, which uh, many people said was Mary Magdalene. Yeah, but the symbol is what you have to understand. You have to see that with the eyes, with the spiritual eyes of the objective reasoning. It has many degrees. So, Malkut is feminine. And that's why when we talk about the soul, we talk about as a feminine aspect. Remember that we talk about the mystery of Adam and Eve. Eve is feminine, is Orb, which is a fallen serpent. The lunar fallen serpent going to the abyss is Ob, is Eve, is Mary Magdalene, is prostituted. It's a prostitute. And that is within each one of us. We will say, symbolically speaking, that everybody carries Mary Magdalene as a prostitute within. But uh, to more specific, we will say, uh, I mean, uh, Nahema. 
which is the mother of adultery and prostitution. But if you enter into the path, and then you become a magician, a priest, because magician comes from mag, which means priest. It's by being priest, and then you uh, enter as Mary Mag, Mag, you see, magician. Dalen is an explanation related with Dalan, which is valley, an old word for valley, Dalan, preserved from extinction in north of England by the Norse. And of course, it is always stated that Mary Magdalene was not from the Jewish race, but was from the Nordic race, from a Celtic race. So therefore, Mary Magdalene means a priestess adept from other lands or valleys. A white priestess wife. In this case, for Mary Magdalene. That's precisely the, the, the meaning of it. So the initiate that is called Mary Magdalene in the Gospels was of white race and was the wife of Master Jesus. And from her he was working with alchemy. And she represents Malkut, the female aspect in which you have to work hard in order to elaborate the men of the sixth day. Which is, of course, the union. You see, now you are visualizing better. When you are disintegrating those egos and that sapience of sin is going up, it's absorbed by Gebura, by the consciousness, by the superlative consciousness of the being. And in here is where it's absorbed or initiations, degrees. Hmm? And that's why now you understand why Christ, Chochma, through Gebura and descending into the abyss, disintegrated seven capital sins from Mary Magdalene. This is precisely as written in the Gospels. That being a prostitute, she became holy, a saint, because Christ took the seven capital sins from her. But of course, it's not like the ignoramuses think that he put all the hands of her and seven demons came out and she became automatically holy, a saint, in one moment. No. That is a psychological process in which the initial has to descend and had to work to the Buddhist annihilation to clean in that Mary Magdalene little by little, bit by bit, until cleaning her completely. And then that female aspect of Neshama becomes united with Helen, which is precisely when the inheritance of Christ is placed. And that is precisely, that the outcome is precisely the objective reasoning of the being, the other degree acquired for that. But here we have to go deeper into this in order for you to understand the different aspects of the drama, this Buddhist Christianity. Remember that uh, Geburah is ruled by the sun. And when you place, as we say, all the sephiroth in the way, in the three brains, the three triangles, you find that the heart is in relation with the sun. And the sun is in relation with Tifereth, but also with Geburah, with Chochmah, and with Hod. And it's precisely in Hod, or in the solar force, where we find Judah. Because we had to talk about Judas. 
And Judas, of course, is in relation with Judah. And to the Old Testament, you find the symbol of, of uh, Judah. Let me read for you what the Old Testament says about Judah. Judah, you art he whom your brethren shall praise. Your hand shall be in the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion cub. Etc., etc. Judah is a lion cub. You know, when we go on to Zen Buddhism, we find this expression also. A lion cub. What is a lion cub? According to Zen Buddhism, is he who understands the truth, the Zen, the Zen truth hidden within any myth or within any allegory. That's why the monks of Zen Buddhism, when they acquire the development of the consciousness, the Buddhi, the Prajna Paramita, they receive the title of Lion Cub. But is Lion Cub? Yeah, of course. The Buddha is the lion, and the Cub is the disciple, the monk. When we say that Judah is the lion cub, we are talking about, of course, the baby, the, the child of the lion, which is Christ, which is the Buddha. But here precisely is because in Geburah you find that that Prachna Paramita is the Buddha himself, Hesed, the Buddha. And in Geburah you find that lion also, the other lion that comes from above, which is Chokma, which is Avalokiteshvara. And it's precisely it's stated that the Bodhisattva is an incarnation of Avalokiteshvara, but it's a Buddha. The Buddha is Hesed, is Atman, united with that Prajna and with the union of Avalokiteshvara or Chokma, as we explain. So then, of course, there are fallen lion calves, which is a fallen bodhisattva. It's a lion cub, a cub that knows the wisdom, but because has ego, it's difficult. The master explains how those cubs sometimes go into the Zen monasteries and start insulting or being jerk with the disciples until finally the lion appears within them and speaks. Speaks because... They are lion cubs, they are fallen, but they are lion cubs. Of course, it is better to be a resurrected lion cub than a fallen lion cub. But that's, of course, in Zen Buddhism, expression in order for those that require a lot of comprehension, analysis, understanding of the doctrine. And Judah is a lion cub. This is the book of Genesis. If you read more about Judah in Genesis and in the Bible, you will find how Judah is attributed to Leo, the constellation of Leo. Because the constellation of Leo is in relation with the heart. And that's why the highest of all the great masters among all the hierarchies uh, ab abide in the constellation of Leo. Because they are lion cubs. They are bodhisattvas of the straight path. That's why we always state a Jew is a bodhisattva, a self realized master. This is how you have to understand it. That's why it's written in the Gospel of Judah that the only one that could see Jesus face to face, Judah, of course, is the cub, and Jesus is the lion. The only one that can see him face to face, eye to eye, is Judas. 
because it's part of him. But unfortunately, when that calf is fallen, within him is lust, anger, pride, vanity, and all of that degeneration that we have within. And this is precisely what Judas Iscariot represents in the Gospels. That's why in the first moment when Jesus knows that Judas has to leave because he has to die. Judas is that element within which the ego is very strong in relation with sex. Because we always state it and repeat that Judas is that apostle that represents the sexual force. And if you find that Tiferet in relation with Yesod, you understand why. The forces, the solar forces are precisely in the sex. But when the work of the initiate is being performed, is in the heart, in Hod. The ritual of Hod, or the magic of Hod, is called the Eucharist, or the Last Supper. The Last Supper of Jesus is performed in Hod. Because in there is how you will receive guidance. But from there is from Judas departed. Jesus never ejected Judas from the Last Supper. He gave Judas the, la the, the bread and wine and Judas took it. And after that Judas abandoned Hod, in other words, betrays the heart. Because treason is in relation with the heart. But treason is in relation with that area of Hod, Geburah, and Chokmah, which is always in, that, in this area. So Judas withdraws from the ritualistic Last Supper and goes and betrays the Lord. He goes down. But you know there that this is happening within the initiate. That part which is Judas, part of his consciousness, which is mingled with degeneration, goes down in order to fulfill the scriptures. Because the Son of Man has to be delivered has to go into a process in which the Son of Man, which is the Bodhisattva, the Neumaticon, has to disintegrate the ego, to annihilate it completely. But for that, that sapience of sin, which is still degeneration, has to go up to Gebura, which means to the consciousness. The consciousness has to know and we talk about that when we were talking about the ring of the Nibelungen. How suddenly the Valkyria is uh, reduced to sin, to adultery, by Siegfried going down. It's the same thing. So here, Judas go down, and of course, by going down means to perform the sexual act. But Judas is, is inside. It's not outside. Because in ancient times, 2,000 years ago, Judas was represented by, ma uh, by the master Judas at that time. In order to represent the drama. But that happens inside of you. Or inside of the Bodhisattva. The Bodhisattva takes a wife. Or if he's a female, takes a husband. Related with nemesis. Related with karma, related with kamaduro, karmazaya, or katansia, whatever you call it, it's always gebura. Because he, he is going to start the process of annihilating that karma or that ego. In the case of Master Jesus, he takes Mary Magdalene. This is the symbol, I'm telling you, of the Gospels. I'm not saying that in that very moment Jesus took Mary Magdalene, no. I'm saying that in that moment, when Judas is going and betraying the Lord, is when Jesus is taking Mary Magdalene as his wife. And of course, that is bringing up into the consciousness of the initiate all the process of treason. 
because his consciousness is being mingled with the fallen bodies, uh, part of it. So then, Judas be betrays him in the sex. But when that energy is rising, which is the sixth viper of light of the sixth Venustic initiation, when that viper reaches the heart, which is the level, and then Jesus is delivered to Caiaphas, to the hypocritical Pharisees that are within the initiate, not outside, are within him. And all the consciousness of the Bodhisattva is disturbed because the Logos is rising up and knowing the evil that we created because of our fall. And of course, there are a lot of egos here in this area will feel good. Phariseeism. When you offend that you are holy because you believe in this, you believe in that. Because you are sacrificing yourself for humanity. And of course you mock the Lord. When in the outside world you are accused. And then you say no I didn't do anything. Oh I am holy. Right. Yes the Lord is holy. But you are not holy. And when they the priest. Or that emotional center. That ego within you which is Caiaphas. Which is a demon, cannot deal with the Lord because the Lord keeps silence. Then the energy keeps on. The Lord, the energy of the Lord, which is light, goes up to the head. You see? It's a spinal column. And when it reaches the head, he finds Pontius Pilatus, Pontius Pilate, the demon of, of the head. And of course, you know, the intellect is the governor the president, the chief of your own body. And then the pilot washes his hands, justify everything that is being accused or the tests that Lucifer placed to the initiate. And then the initiate says, uh, I'm not guilty. Uh, I didn't do this. I didn't do it. This is a phrase that I saw some place, I don't know. I didn't do it, I didn't do it. And uh, the Lord is being accused, of course, of his filthiness, of his bad things. And the Lord didn't do it, but he did it. That's why any initiative that passes that ordeal in different levels, because it's always different levels in which you are passing that ordeal, you have to say, yeah, I did it. In order for the Lord not to receive the, the, the stoning, which is your inner being. But of course, the demon of the mind always washes the hands. Right? And after accumulation and accumulation of sins and defects and vices, and finally all that outcome, after passing through Judas, Caiaphas, and Pilate, the three brains, finally, the conjunction of all of that is what we call Barabbas. And then appeals Barabbas there, right? Between Pilate, I mean between Jesus and uh, Barabbas, the meaning of Barabbas means the son of the earth, because Bar is son. But is ready with the, 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 the rune Bar, the Nordics, which means son of the earth. Of course, Barabbas, all of that mixture of consciousness with ego, is the outcome of the fall. It's a degenerated being. And then, Ecce homo, behold the man, the Bodhisattva appears there, Facing the negativity that came out from the bodhicitta that is still is in process. And that is Barabbas. And then the intellect, which is Pilate, states in front of himself. He says, who should I liberate? 
Barabbas or Jesus, the son of man that came from above and is making this trouble within my psyche. And of course, the multitude of egos within you, within the initiate screens, liberate Barabbas. Right? Liberate the ego. Because we belong to him. We don't want to die. And what do you want to uh, want me to do with Jesus, the son of man? The pneumaticon that descended from below and is making this disturbance in our own psyche. Crucifixia. Crucify him. Crucify him. And yeah, the Lord is condemned to death by our own particular ego. And that's precisely the moment and when the initiate is facing his own nemesis. Because all the karma, you see, that has to be applied to the ego, that has to be applied to the defects and vices that we have, the Lord received them. And that is what is written. That is being lashed 5,000 times. Five is the law. And all the process that comes after that is related with the karma of the initiate. Pilate, with his justifications, comes and puts in the head of that initiate the crown of thorns. Meaning that the Lord already is defeating them by being passive, by being in comprehension, in meditation, and utilizing telema, because that's the sign of, of the crown of thorns, telema, willpower. And of course, as a hero, he is doing it for his consciousness. He's doing it for his Helen. He's going to face that, which is a long process. Symbolically, of course, in the Venustic initiation, is passed when the initiate rises, the sixth viper of light. But that is initiation. In the physical plane, he has to face all of the karma and to work very hard in order not to betray the Lord. We talk already about the three, three denials of Peter in the previous lecture. But here, in that passion of the Lord, the cross, death and resurrection, is precisely a phenomena which is called symbiosis. In which you find the union of two beings, but without mixture. The Lord, being holy, being saint, is accused of things that he didn't do it. But that the Buddha, like the sinful consciousness, did it. And he, in that process, is the same process as disintegrating the seven demons that he took from Mary Magdalene. That process is being done with Mary Magdalene. And this is precisely what we have to understand. All that is precisely the drama that was taken on purpose, was taken off on purpose from the Bible, from the Gospels, because the Pharisees didn't like it. They want just a castrated Jesus, a Jesus without a wife. But no initiate can do this work without sexual alchemy. So Mary Magdalene corresponds directly to Jesus in his drama, in his development. This is how he developed the last degree of objective reasoning. This is how he acquired and clad. Because he was fallen. But he raised again and acquired the, the degree of unclad. Which is the highest degree of objective reasoning. If potkulad is very rare, which is the fifth trident... It's very rare to find a potkulad in the universe. More rare, even rare, is unclad. And this is Jesus. And of course, his knowledge 
written in the Gospels and uh, in many other uh, apocrypha are being interpreted by the intellect of people that not even initiates. They don't know what they talk about. You have to be on the path in order to understand the knowledge according to the objective reasoning that you are developing or that you develop is a, if you are a fallen bodhisattva. And that's precisely here. This is how uh, ends when the initiate uh, receives the sentence. Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And all this. In that moment, the ego of that initiate will fight with all of its strength in order not to be annihilated. Because Nemesis, the Divine Mother, through Geburah, in the work of the Bodhicitta and the Bodhisattva, will disintegrate that ego. Pilate will be disintegrated. Caiaphas will be disintegrated. And of course, the disciple, the calf that really loves the Lord, is Judas, that willingly goes and says, I betrayed my Lord and I didn't want it to do it, and now I'm going to hang myself in the tree of life, or in the tree of knowledge. And he kills himself. Of course, this is a process. This is not like you go and hang yourself physically in a tree, and that's it. No. This is a psychological process, in which Judas first, which symbolizes desire, is annihilated. And then the Lord emerges from him, and the disintegrates Caiaphas and all of those uh, individuals or psychological aggregates related with Barabbas that put in, in him in, in that situation. And, of course, we will talk about that more in other lectures about the resurrection. Now you can ask questions in order to extend more in this lecture. Show mercy. Of course, the Divine Mother is merciful towards the consciousness, not towards the ego. The ego is always an entity that shouldn't be inside of us. That's why many times I remember the case of the Master Samael on Veor. He uh, was going to face the Kamaduro of having many wives in past lives. And his mother called him and told him, my son, you betray me for many women in the past. And then he said, yes, my mother, but that was in the past. Today I'm loving you and I faithful, I faithful for you and I won't do anything against you. No, he says, you did that in the past and you had to pay for it. And then the, the mother said, well, it's true, right? This is Kamaduro. I'm sorry, you had to do that by working with the moon. To work that, I mean, to overcome that by working with the moon. You know, all the process in which the master, the master dies because it's, it's the punishment of the law of justice, you know, the goddess of Nemesis is unpunishable. It's, I mean, uh, unmerciful with the ego and with that type of karma. All sins are forgiven except the sins against the Holy Spirit. There is mercy, and this is the type of mercy. The Divine Mother is not going to take that sin right now, or to punish you for, for, for that right now, only until you disintegrate your ego. Because if she punishes you right now for that, then you will have physical body, you will die. And how are you going to continue your path? So that's why that type of karma is paid until the end. That's the mercy of the law. But it's unforgivable. And of course, there are some uh, karmas that are for, for, forgivable. But after you disintegrate the ego. Who's supposed to be 
Well, the Kaon, Gebura within you, the Kaon, your internal police, informs the, the goddess of justice, which is the Divine Mother, all your doings, good and evil. And of course, if you want mercy, you can pray to your internal Kaon to intercede to your Divine Mother. Because you are receiving certain type of karma, very strong, and you want some break. And then the goddess of justice will see what you do in the physical plane, in your, inside of you and in favor of others, and she can change your karma, because she is the only one who can do it. Nemesis. But according to the deeds, you know, faith without deeds is death, dead Of course, the deepest you fall, the highest you ascend. But let me tell you, when you have a certain degree of objective reasoning and you fall, you fall in the same height, at the same, uh, how you call measure of the height that you are, that's the fall, you know. That's why it's very painful, very painful. If you are very high, you, they say that you are in the degree of Ternonald, which is a very high degree, and you fall, and then you are going very deep. And in order to go up again, you have to fight and you have to sweat blood. It's very hard. Right? Some initiates, they, that's why they don't fall. They descend. They descend, yeah. They they do it uh, gentle, not not spilling, just transmuting. Yeah. Can it be the will of the deity for the initiate to descend in order to achieve a higher degree of objective reasoning, even though the sexual act is forbidden for a resurrected master? Sometimes a resurrected master receives a mission in order to go and sacrifice himself for humanity and do certain works, and then the being says, "You will appear in the three-dimensional world." But in order to sustain there, you need to practice sexual magic. So I give you permission to practice sexual magic in order to sustain there. So then the being don't withdraw. You know? And then he is not, uh, he cannot develop more reason in there even if he practices sexual magic because he's doing it with the permission of God. The only way is by doing it without permission and then with withdraws and he has to go again. But God will punish you. Because it's, what are you doing? What I didn't tell you. You want more reasoning, right? Okay, I will give you that. But wait uh, to Mahama, Mahama Mantaras. And, and that's precisely the, the pain. Hmm. What are the names of the first two levels of objective reasoning? Oh, I don't uh, recall those names right now. But of course, they, they have the names. I... After we inquire and meditate and receive the names in internal planes, one of these uh, years, I will write it <laughs> and say it. Yeah? What happens if a being who has unclogged falls and despite the difficulty manages to rise again? Does he get even more of this No. Those uh, that reach that level can fall into damnation. Damnation means that in order for them to arise again into the level where we were, they were, Christ has to incarnate because Christ is the one that does the work and Christ suffers too much. And clad is the last level that Christ gives with his suffering. Beyond that is putting God, putting Christ into too much suffering. And that's selfishness. That's very, very way very bad to th I don't think that uh, anyone reaching unclad will do it because for what if you reach unclad go into the absolute there is no more degrees the only one that is higher than you is the absolute those causes of karma are removed by the goddess nemesis the divine mother 
or by the Lord, Chokhmah, incarnated within the Bodhisattva after the disintegration. Because it's in Tifereth, where Chokhmah works very hard in order to disintegrate those causes within the Bodhisattva. But after the disintegration of the ego, those causes cannot be disintegrated if the ego is still alive. If your ego is still alive, well, forget about those causes. Just disintegrate your ego. And when you have cleaning your mind and your consciousness of ego, then the causes could be disintegrated. And then karma is forgiven. Except Kamaduro. Yeah? For a being of absolute perfection, the absolute, the absolute never falls. A being of absolute perfection. Absolute, aparamarta satya. It's difficult, because aparamarta satya enters into a certain level in which uh, uh, all uh, dangers of falling are gone, are out. Is is not possible. Yeah. Yeah, Kaparamarta Satya cannot fall because he's out uh, uh, of of the dangers. Beyond that. What do you mean when you say that they fall into damnation? Does that mean that you never rise again? Damnation means that uh, in order for them to arise again, he has to suffer uh, through many Mahamantaras. Or the other way is to be disintegrated in hell. Through many Mahamantaras. Because the karma is so heavy. This is, it might be cases of that. And the uh, beings that are into damnation. Because they are uh, initiates that fall on purpose. And, bec- and become black magicians. In order to acquire more light. Like Morlock, Belial, Andramelech. And many of them. They did it on purpose. And that's why they, they are looked because they are doing evil f- on purpose. You know what I mean? Initially that fall, but they don't become black magicians. They're black, but doing on purpose like Moloch, that's very dangerous. When you say um, we make the decision to take the straight or spiral path, it's not an intellectual decision that we make, obviously, right? No. That has nothing to do with the ego. The intellectual animal uh, reasoning here could think, oh yeah, I, I will take the straight path. No. That's the objective reasoning. When you reach the level of Tiferet, then that's the monad that decides. Tiferet with, with Gebura and, and, and Hesed. Because Tiferet is the will. You know? The human will. But they, you cannot think. I, it reminds me uh, the master Samael. When the end, well, what's before the guardian of the two paths, the guardian asks, which two, of these two ways are you going to, to take, to, to follow the path, to follow your initiation, your self-realization? And he says, uh, let me think about it. No, 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 don't think about it. Right now, you have to answer. Don't think. And then the master says, well, I take the direct path. Okay, you are going to suffer a lot. But it's done. You know? Because let me think about it. Uh, let me go into return to my physical body and, and talk with my family. And no. Yeah. Is the state of the class the same as Paramarta Satya? Well, uh, Paramarta Satya is somebody that is beyond unclad. Because they enter into the absolute, and of course, there there are more ex- ex- how you call exaltations but which are not related with the dissension of the universe. The Paramartha Satyas are exalted and exalted within the Absolute in something that is un- uncomprehensible for us. Or incomprehensible. Incomprehensible. That's the word. Incomprehensible for anyone, for, even for the gods. You know? Is Jesus and Nazareth the only one that uh, did the work seven times? Oh, no. No, he's not the only one. He is the only one that we know here. But uh, uh, the universe is huge. You know what I mean? That's huge. Uh, this uni- how m- we are talking about the planet Earth, which is among millions of planets 
in this galaxy. And this galaxy is only one of the millions of galaxies in this infinite. And there are not only one infinite, there are many infinites. So, that he is the one that sacrificed himself for this planet in order to help this humanity? Yes. He is a Paramatta Sari that did it. And humanity really is paying him with bitterness because nobody is following the path. They think that he's only believing in him. Oh, I believe in Jesus of Nazareth and this is it. No, this is ludicrous. You know what I mean? This is work that we are explaining here. It's very difficult. And he helps because he already did it seven times. But only if you enter into the path. Do you have another question? Well, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I hope you acquire the symbiosis one day. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah, no.